putting this conference together and inviting us to speak here. Um, Tom and I are pleased to have the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, a book and some of the ideas in it that we had the good fortune of editing with uh, about 30 of our colleagues from around the world uh, called Psychedelic Medicine. Uh, so what I'm going to do in, in the first part of the talk is uh, speak to what I think are some of the major implications that come from the work of uh, many of the researchers around the world who have been looking at these uh, diverse substances for the last 30, 40 years. Um, the first thing I was going to say is that uh, looking at these substances is not something particularly new. Uh, as I will uh, suggest in a talk that I give on Sunday, I think there's a good reason to believe that humans have been ingesting these substances intentionally or unintentionally for perhaps as long as five million years and that there's a now I think good uh, genetic evidence to indicate that we evolved or co-evolved through the use of these substances. So I will uh, on Sunday substantiate uh, Terence McKenna's hypothesis which uh, with uh, research that's been done in the last several years. Um, clearly the, um, the middle upper Paleolithic transition 40,000 years ago, the advent of modern cultural consciousness uh, is something that clearly has major shamanic elements and many people would say also has a clear evidence of the use of a variety of psychedelic drugs. However, the Western world didn't manage to uh, maintain much of that ancient knowledge and uh, when we as Westerners started to record this information, it was largely considered to be the witch's brew and um, evidence of knowledge of those substances or their use was generally sufficient to have you tortured to death. So. This knowledge has been lying dormant and um, or unconscious and in many parts of the world for uh, thousands of years and it's been only in the last 100, 150 years that we've started to see a, a minor resurgence of it. Uh, unfortunately, much of what might have been known from the many cultures that were using these plants 500 years ago when the Western colonization of the Americas began uh, was also brutally destroyed and uh, in many cases did not come back to light until once again only about 50 years ago. However, since about the mid 19th century, anthropologists deliberately and sometimes unwittingly have begun to uh, record information about the use of a variety of different substances, often in context in which uh, they had little knowledge of what the substances were or actually did. Only a few brave souls actually turned to the use of the substances as a mechanism for finding out why indigenous peoples considered them important. Uh, but over the last 150 years, we have uh, discovered um, an amazing variety of uses for these substances. Uh, to me, it's quite incredible to discover that the same substance might be used for depression as well as for anger, uh, for people who have sores on their feet or sores on their head, people with intestinal parasites or skin parasites, uh, we can find the same plant used for marital problems and for uh, people who want to fall in love as well as for people who want to fall out of love or in some societies to encourage licentiousness and in others to uh, encourage adherence to some notion of a sexual moral standard. Um, I know throughout the Amazonian basin the same substances are used to uh, prepare for warfare with other villages as well as to engage in peace negotiations with other villages. Uh, we find that these substances will be used for uh, witchcraft and to protect you against witchcraft, uh, to do sorcery and to protect against sorcery. Um, the list goes on. Even many of our pre-modern um, compatriots discovered that these things could be used for alcoholism, uh, for a variety of different drug addictions. Um, are these truly panaceas? Um, I, I will hesitatingly say, I think so. And uh, I will just give you a few ideas why I think that is the case, and it's sort of one of the core arguments I make in the introduction to the book. Uh, about a decade ago, I introduced the concept of psychointegrators as what I thought was a more appropriate term than the popular hallucinogen, uh, not to replace other terms such as entheogen or a psychedelic, but to reflect on the remarkable similarities that these plants induce in human consciousness and in the brain. And my understanding of these plants in terms of the neurotransmitter systems is that in a variety of different ways, they enhance what serotonin does in our brain and sometimes sort of take serotonin to a, a whole new level of functioning. Um, in simple terms, what I see serotonin is doing in the brain is functioning not so much as a neurotransmitter, but as a neuromodulator. 
That is to say, its function is to modulate the activities of all the other different neurotransmitter systems, as well as to modulate activities across the levels of the brain. And uh, I've been very fond of the neurobiologist Paul McLean's model of the triune brain. And I find it very instructive to sort of interface the psychointegrators with serotonin, with the triune brain, to understand why there's so many different things that these substances can be used to treat. Uh, at the level of what McLean called the reptilian brain, our ancient behavioral brain, uh, we find these substances basically opening up the channels of information. One of the things that serotonin does is to sort of keep a lid on the immense amount of information that our nervous system is capable of processing so that we can deal with what's most important. And what we know with these substances is that these dampening mechanisms of the brain are basically opened up. We get access to things that we normally have repressed or habituated. And so as many of you well know, these substances all of a sudden make the world seem alive and vibrant as an entity that's really a, a, a kind of conscious, sentient being. And I think it's because now we have this immense amount of information that normally we are basically habituating or shunting out from consciousness. The next level of the brain, uh, what McLean called the paleomammalian brain, we find serotonin basically sort of regulating both the information that the emotional brain gets and passing it up to the frontal cortex. And once again, we see what these substances do is open up the emotional channels of the brain, open up the visual channels of the brain that uh, incidentally played a significant role in primate and hominid and human evolution. So once again, we see this vast expansion of information being opened up to us that's always there, but not normally available to consciousness. And then if we look at the serotonogic projections to the brain, they basically run up the brain stem, come out of the reptilian brain, project to our mammalian brain, and then diffusely project to the whole brain. So what is, I think, a characteristic signature of what I call the psychointegrators are these hypersynchronous theta wave discharge patterns that link the three levels of the brain together. They basically bring the unconscious into consciousness. I remember as an undergraduate student, they said, oh, we only use 5% of our brain or 10% of our brain. I always wonder, what's the other 90% doing? Well, it's like keeping a lid on things. And I think what we can see the psychointegrators as doing is basically opening ourselves up to the potentials of our own brains and integrating the behavioral, the emotional, and the cognitive into some kind of coherent system of understanding. So if you hear me refer time and time again in my talk to the psychointegrators, it's because I, I prefer to think of them in those terms, not that psychedelic as mind manifesting isn't useful, or that terms such as entheogen don't have their context. Uh, but I think entheogen sort of leads us to the conclusion that it's merely a spiritual phenomena, and that in the context of being a spiritual phenomena, science might not have a role. And I prefer to think of them as psychointegrators because of a variety of evolutionary impacts that they've had upon human consciousness and development. So what is our basis for a legitimate use of psychedelic medicines? I think there can be a lot of different kinds of knowledge that we use. I'm sure some of you who are familiar with the medical protocols would say we must have the double blind clinical studies uh, I'm sure that you may also recognize that most of the medicines in use today have not been subjected to double-blind clinical studies, uh, and that even those that have have become, in some cases, a very dangerous drugs to even use in typical medical context. If we look at what medicine is often relied upon, it is beginning with things such as cross-cultural patterns. Medicine in the context of ethnobotany and ethnopharmacology is typically sought out knowledge about plant uses in other cultures to provide a basis for screening of phytochemicals to make an analog that can be patented so that millions of dollars can be made off of them. So medicine has often followed the time-honored tradition of finding out what people in other cultures do. Um, another approach is to say that basically these are religious substances or spiritual substances and that they should be treated as such and that we should be allowed to use them on that basis. Uh, the argument has gotten limited acceptance, although in the context of the United States, it's notable that two plant substances have come to be normalized within the judicial system. Uh, peyote, uh, with a history going back almost 100 years, uh, although at this time largely limited to use by Native Americans. Um, and then we have the ayahuasca churches, particularly the Unión de Vegetal, uh, 
uh, which only uh, about two years ago uh, won a Supreme Court decision that basically stayed the Attorney General's efforts to restrict their use, saying that at this time there was no evidence that there was considerable harm. Um, these contexts are, I think, are important ones for our continued use and exploration of these plants, but uh, many of you would find yourself unwelcomed in the peyote church. Native Americans are not interested in anybody else, particularly white people opening up their own branches of the peyote church, so we will largely be excluded from pursuing that venue. Whether or not the ayahuasca churches provide us with a venue to look at the extended application of these substances remain to be seen. They certainly are a very popular venue within Brazil. Uh, we certainly have the widespread use of the uh, ayahuasca tourism in Peru and other parts of uh, Latin America. And some of the ayahuasca churches have gotten legitimacy and acceptance in various countries in Europe and the United States. Uh, but I think for most of us, the idea of going to church to use peyote or ayahuasca probably seems a little antithetical to what we actually feel is the right context for using these things. So it's not going to be a, a good one for most of us to explore. Although uh, in a talk tomorrow, I will look at some of those possibilities. I think the real question, apart from the political one that we'll address at the end of my talk and in Tom's talk, is is there sound scientific evidence and good clinical evidence for using these substances. And I want to suggest that we do have evidence uh, in the form of epidemiological evidence, in the form of triangulation, and in the form of what the uh, Food and Drug Administration refers to as phase one and phase two studies. Um, in um, psychedelic medicine, Eve Fresca writes a chapter called Therapeutic Guidelines, Dangers and Contraindications in the Therapeutic Applications of Hallucinogens in which he really asked the question, what is the evidence that these substances are harmful in terms of uh, evidence of mortality? And what he points out is that you know, there really is very little evidence whatsoever that the broad class of substances that we refer to as psychedelic medicines do contribute to any adverse health outcomes. Uh, certainly, as, as Eddie points out in the article, there are contraindications. There are certain categories of people that probably should not be administered these substances. Uh, but Eddie makes the point that even when we include everything that we could call abuse along with what we might consider to be intelligent, well-directed use of these substances, there really is little evidence at all that they're harmful, particularly when we think about comparison drugs such as alcohol, which in the U.S. kills about 300,000 people a year, uh, tobacco kills 400,000 people a year, uh, prescription drugs may kill 100,000 people a year when they're applied in legitimate ways. So even when we look at all the different ways in which we can think about the problems related to uh, toxicity, uh, there's very little evidence that these substances really do present some kind of danger to humans that use them or perhaps even abuse them. Um, in one of the chapters by Alper and Lotsoff, they uh, introduced the idea of triangulation. Uh, as another way to look at what is good scientific data regarding the legitimate use of these substances. And they indicate that we can use things such as animal research, where it's not possible to carry out human research. Animals have been studied, and we've been able to do a variety of toxicology studies using animals. They point out that uh, medical case studies has been one of the primary ways in which medicine has always made judgments about the utility of medicines and that clinical judgment and clinical experience is also a significant set of guidelines to use in deciding when these substances are appropriate for use. Uh, they also point to the notion of the personal accounts of the people that use them themselves, and this is in the context of looking at people who have used these substances to try to address substance abuse problems. And many people who have employed them in this context have come back with reports about how they have been able to obtain and achieve sobriety through the use of these substances. So these three different forms of evidence can provide a good basis for assessing whether or not these substances are useful, even if we have not been able to get to the context of uh, advanced clinical trials. I would also point to the uh, cross-cultural uses and alleged effects, and in particular a principle that I've used for many years. If people in diverse parts of the world use the same plant for the same kind of condition, that is the kind of independent discovery and independent verification that I think we should pay attention to and give credence in terms of being good data regarding the effectiveness of a substance. Um, patient satisfaction and enhanced activities of daily living. Do people function better once they start to take these substances? And once again, thinking in the context of uh, 
substance abusers who are addicted to opiates and things like this. And clearly, a lot of the evidence suggests that yes, they do begin to function much better. And then we can look at pharmacological studies. They give us some ideas of the mechanisms of action and give us a rationale for considering certain substances to, in fact, be good forms of treatment. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, which I understand has similar kinds of institutes in uh, most countries for the approval of new medicines, has an idea that we should go through four phases, four kinds of trials in terms of assessing substances and whether or not they should be widely available as medicines. Uh, phase one trials that are primarily concerned with issues of toxicity, uh, but also trying to determine whether or not they're dangerous side effects and what might be appropriate doses. A uh, phase two trials that evaluate small groups of patients for effectiveness and try to target doses for specific kinds of illnesses. And then the phase three trials where we really begin the randomized clinical trials with large groups of patients that are designed to uh, confirm effectiveness, uh, monitor adverse effects, and often bring in a variety of control conditions that allow us to determine whether or not the substance is more effective than other commonly used treatments. And then the phase four trials, which are really concerned more with the long-term assessment and long-term benefits of the uh, use of specific substances for specific conditions. Now, given what has been a virtual prohibition on human research with these substances for about 40 years, uh, we don't have the ideal kinds of studies that we would like to have in order to assess where a variety of psychedelic medicines fall along this continuum. Uh, but in the uh, psychedelic medicine book, we asked our various authors to assess how they viewed the different substances that they were experts in. And uh, what we came to conclude is that in most cases, we find that there's a wide variety of substances that have, in general, passed the criteria of toxicology assessments, the phase one assessments, that in many cases there are good phase two studies that give us an idea that these substances are likely to be effective for a variety of specific kinds of conditions. Uh, in some cases, the evidence is limited and more related to case studies uh, rather than the ideal clinical studies that we would like to have. Uh, and at the same time, we should point out that it's virtually impossible to carry these out in a large-scale, systematic kind of way with the hundreds of millions of dollars that's normally necessary to carry them through the full range of clinical trials. So in this sense, I say that we can find most of these substances here have passed what would, in the context of other drugs, then be given widespread acceptance for exploration of other kinds of treatments beyond the ones that they were specifically evaluated for in the first place. So to sort of summarize this, I would say that the phase one safety data supports the wider applications of psychedelic medicines and their reclassification is schedule two. And indeed, most phase two studies have already been done, although these were normally done in the 1950s and 1960s before the concept of the double blind clinical study became the uh, golden standard of medicine. And so a lot of these studies don't have controls that would eliminate placebo effects. I think we also have to ask the question of whether or not eliminating placebo effects is really what we want to do when we employ psychedelic medicines. If we go back to the notion that they're intervening in the serotonogic system, which is designed to modulate a lot of different aspects of our consciousness, behavioral, emotions, and cognitive, clearly, using these substances in a way that allows people to focus their intention and to employ the suggestibility that these substances often evoke really should be part of how we assess them. In contemporary terms, we would talk about this as an integrative medicine approach where we're combining various kinds of tools to see if we get an enhanced effect. Um, so I think for a lot of reasons, the, the lack of placebo control studies really shouldn't deter us from considering these substances to have adequate phase two evaluations. And uh, we would point out that in, in many cases, there's a good reasons to suggest that even phase three and phase four studies uh, are already in effect being carried out. For instance, in a paradox, the federal government of the United States reimburses doctors who are medicine doctors who use peyote to treat alcoholics. So in our book, Joseph Calabrese documents this paradox where on one hand, it's a schedule one substance without medical uh, use, but on the other hand, the federal government will reimburse Indian doctors to treat alcoholic patients. 
Um, so what should we be looking at here? I'll just give you an overview of some of the, the major points that uh, come out of the book. And I must say that the, the book really is uh, most useful because of the high caliber of people who have been contributors to it. And many of them are here at the conference. Andrew Sewell is here. Uh, he will talk about cluster headaches. He and John Halpern uh, did an article on the response of cluster headache to psilocybin and LSD. Um, and I think that this is one of the areas in which we start to see a, a new set of arguments that can be made for the use of these substances. And it's sort of a moral imperative argument, which is to say that there are conditions out there which are so fatal, literally, such as the cluster headaches, also referred to as suicide headaches, that anything that would help people ought to be considered justified. Um, and in this context, what Halpern and Sewell discovered is that uh, both LSD and psilocybin really are effective treatments uh, with success rates that are in the high 90% compared to standard medical treatments that are probably only about 5%. Indeed, in, in the case of the cluster headaches, I would say, do we really need studies about this? Uh, another point I would make about the, uh, the research that they've done is that uh, this didn't start off as medical research in the sense that you know, someone with an MD was looking at some substances that might prove to be useful. Instead, what was happening was that people discovered on their own, gee, I did psilocybin and I haven't had a cluster headache for six or eight or ten months, you know, I wonder if there's a relationship. And the next time it happens, they're out there on the street looking for psilocybin and lo and behold, there goes the cluster headache in a matter of hours. Uh, so, once again, I think if we decide to take psychedelic medicine seriously as potential medical treatments, we ought to look at what people in many cultures around the world have already been doing with these substances, at some cases for hundreds if not thousands of years. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, another contributor to our book who's here at the conference, Michael Mithoffer, wrote on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we also have another presenter here, Owen, who will be talking about uh, his own studies on MDMA psychotherapy for PTSD. Um, I think once again here we also have another moral imperative for the use of the psychedelic medicines. Um, as Mithoffer points out, uh, there's about 10% of people who suffer trauma who end up with post-traumatic stress disorder. And he estimates that I think about in the United States, about 8% of the population is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorders. Uh, this is once again a condition that does not have an acceptable treatment that's effective. And uh, at this point in time, we are unfortunately in a situation where we are producing more and more cases. Uh, we know that in the United States, the high suicide rate among servicemen and women who are in Iraq and the high suicide rate among them when they return, uh, they're coming back and they're becoming violent abusers. They're emotionally traumatized, not only from what they did, but from what they saw happen and the carnage and atrocities of war in Iraq. Uh, they're people that are seriously in need of help. And at this point, we don't have a treatment for them. Um, and even getting George Bush out of office won't change that. So uh, we need to find some way to try to deal with the serious problems that have been produced by these modern atrocities. And uh, we have some good ideas about how to do it. Another set of contributors to our book, George Greer and Rekla Tolberg, a right on therapeutic uses of MDMA. And they point out before the prohibition on MDMA, uh, there was a development of a very clear set of uh, guidelines regarding what are some of the best uses, best practices for employing these substances. So it's not as if we have to start off ignorant of you know, how to use these kinds of uh, medicines. We really, at this point, know how to use them and we'll you know, ultimately have to find a way to uh, get the politicians to allow that to happen. Um, another condition that's uh, talked about in our book uh, by Michael Montage, psychedelic therapy for the treatment of depression. Uh, clearly depression is one of the most widely uh, diagnosed conditions in the world today. Uh, it's the most widely treated condition with pharmaceuticals. Uh, there's an irony in it in that most physicians will tell you that the medicines that are being used to treat depression are considered to be pharmacologically ineffective after about three to six months. Of course, that doesn't keep people from using them for year after year after year and wondering why they're still depressed. So the major treatments that we have available now might be viewed as effective interrupters short term, but with questionable effectiveness in terms of long term uh, treatment goals. In terms of depression, the obvious relevance of serotonin enhancement therapies is indicated by the typical treatment modality, the SSRIs, the serotonin systematic reuptake inhibitors. Uh, however, if we look at how these uh, psychedelic medicines might be employed for these substances, 
it's likely that single treatments over every two to six weeks might be effective in terms of producing what uh, John Halpern has referred to as a psychedelic afterglow that leaves people with a positive affective state. Another uh, article in our book, Psilocybin Treatment of Obsessive Compulsive Disorders by Moreno and Delgado, a look at some of the ways in which they have come to find effective ways of dealing with uh, OCD through the use of psilocybin. And uh, while it's not a, uh, a high priority illness, perhaps, it certainly is one that has a, a lot of significance in terms of limited treatment effectiveness with conventional medical therapies. Um, another article in the book by Charles Grob, The Use of Psilocybin in Patients with Advanced Cancer and Existential Anxiety, addresses something that we all will have to address either in our own lives or in those of others, that is to say, uh, the end of life issues. Uh, we'll also have other presenters here. Sumit Kumar on Saturday will be talking about a, a similar kind of research project. Um, Grob, uh, in his article, only had limited data available. He didn't want to break his double blind to assess all of the patients that had actually gone through his study. But I uh, pulled a quote out of his uh, article that I thought was really uh, to the point, given the universality of the essential existential dilemma of death, that is to say, and the potential for optimally conducted hallucinogen treatment models to significantly enhance the quality of the end of life period, there's clearly a need to develop further research that will demonstrate the utility of this field of hallucinogenic medicine. So these are some of the uh, more conventional areas in which uh, physicians have begun to address how psychedelic medicines might be useful. I'm going to suggest that perhaps the most important of all of them really is in addictions treatment. And uh, if we really combine all the different addictions that plague humans today, I think it's fair to say that drug addiction really is probably the greatest problem that humanity faces today. We lump together cigarettes, and alcohol, and the opiates, cocaine, etc. Um, we have a major health problem that to date really does not have a medical solution. Uh, I don't know how uh, people around the rest of the world deal with the treatment of addictions, but in the United States there really is only one accepted treatment approach. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous, and basically it's a spiritual problem that requires that you know, you get in contact with higher power, God as you understand it, and you undergo a transformation of consciousness that will enable you to see the error of your ways. Now, I've sat in on a few AA meetings, and uh, you can get a slight transformation of consciousness drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes with them, but I don't think it's a very effective transformation of consciousness compared to what can be done with LSD or psilocybin or any of the other psychedelic medicines. Um, one of the paradoxes that I, I find in terms of this whole treatment field is that even the American Medical Association considers Alcoholics Anonymous to be the only acceptable treatment program for addicted physicians. You'd think at least the AMA would come to a pharmacological approach to these problems, but not as of yet. I think part of the problem is that there's a lack of consideration of what are the similarities between alteration of consciousness in general and the alterations of consciousness produced by addictive drugs. And uh, Arnold Mandel, who really modeled my thinking about psychointegrators, pointed out that this is the same underlying dynamic. It doesn't make any difference whether you meditate, whether you have an ecstatic experience from long distance running, uh, whether you use any variety of different substances. They all induce the same kind of dynamics in the brain. The problem is that if you use uh, things like the opiates, uh, you interrupt the body's own production of serotonin and opioids. And so you end up with a dynamic of addiction that can't be overcome by taking more of it. Now, some people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that we should use LSD and psilocybin for drug addicts. But I think uh, you are probably all well aware of the fact that these substances have virtually uh, no addictive potential, at least physically. Clearly, there are dynamics of psychological addiction that may go with them. Uh, but also, their uh, habituation effects uh, tend to preclude the increasing use of the substances, as is typical with people who use opioids. So in uh, volume two of psychedelic medicine, we uh, look at five different major substances that are being used in a variety of contexts around the world to treat addictions. And uh, I'll suggest that they can be seen as falling into two major clusters, one that are more clinical approaches and approaches in which physicians have played a major role in the applications of these substances. And then there's a variety of shamanic or shamanistic applications in which traditional um, types of rituals are the most important way in which the substances have been applied. I don't think that these substances are necessarily appropriate only for clinical 
are shamanic purposes. I think it's largely for historical reasons that they have fallen into one group or the other. Um, so in the beginning of uh, volume two, uh, we have an article by uh, John Halpern that looks sort of at the history of the treatment of alcoholism and other addictions, primarily with LSD. And uh, he makes some uh, very important observations. Uh, he notes that there is good evidence that these substances were very effective for about two months, and that even uh, six month to nine month follow up would show people given a single dose of LSD had much better sobriety than people who were just given uh, mainstream psychotherapeutic approaches. Um, he also notes that many of these early studies lack the kinds of double blind clinical controls that we would like to have, and that consequently they have been largely discounted. But he uh, pulls up a review article by Abu Azab and Anderson in 1971 that did a meta-analysis of 31 early studies between 1953 and 1969 with alcoholics that looked at the potential of LSD and the treatment of addictions, and they found that there is an improvement of more than 50% over control groups with just one single dose. And what Halpern notes is that um, a lot of these studies use the, the case method approach to sort of follow up on particular individuals and discover that there was a kind of uh, an afterglow effect that tended to last about one to two months. And then after that one to two month period, there tend to be uh, recidivism of many of the people who received that single dose. Of course, in, in many cases, people did receive what we would now call a psychedelic dose as opposed to a psycholytic dose. They had these life transformative experiences in which they came to understand the nature of their own addictive dynamics and were able to make a, a transition to sobriety. So if we were to return to the use of uh, LSD and the treatment of alcoholism, clearly the psychedelic model combined with treatments every six weeks to eight weeks would be already well indicated by the literature that's available. Um, one of the other articles uh, in the book by uh, Richard Jensen and Donna Dreyer looks at a case study, one individual who was actually given a lot of media scrutiny back in the 1960s and followed his life and looked at how the single dose of LSD provided a profound transformation of his understanding of his own personal circumstances. And so in a sense, what the LSD model is sort of suggesting is the same thing that Alcoholics Anonymous does, is that there needs to be a change of consciousness. You have to have a recognition of your faults, your understandings, your problems, and how you have contributed to creating the addict that you are. And in that sense, the notion of the psychointegrator then makes sense once again, because what these substances do is basically dredge up from the lower brain levels, particularly stimulating uh, the limbic brain and its memory connections to make these substances uh, tools for enhancing our consciousness and awareness of what our past is, what has contributed to these problems. And this idea of encountering what happened in our past as the key to addiction therapies comes up time and time again. Um, another one of the substances that has uh, gotten increased attention in recent years is ibogaine, a, a root that is uh, originally uh, used in ritual context in West Africa. Um, Ken Alper and Howard Lossoff collaborated in doing an excellent review article on the use of ibogaine in the treatment of addictions. Uh, Valerie Majekio will be doing a paper on the similar topic here on uh, Saturday. Um, I think that the uh, interesting thing about ibogaine, once again, is that this was a discovery that didn't come out of medicine, but came out of the addict subculture. Addicts themselves discovered that ibogaine had the potential to serve as a dramatic interrupter of the dynamics of addiction and craving. And uh, this is something that, uh, through animal studies, and it was Alper and Lotzhoff who suggested this triangulation approach, we know is not a placebo effect. You can do the same thing with rats, get them addicted to opiates, you know, they will self-administer as much as they possibly can, give them a dose of ibogaine, all of a sudden they're not interested in the opiates anymore. So something fundamental has changed in terms of how their brain is handling information. Um, in this context, I would also point out that it's not at all the case that serotonin is clearly the primary uh, transmitter that's being uh, manipulated by ibogaine. Uh, it's not clear at this point exactly what may be the underlying mechanisms. Uh, the general notions that have come uh, out of many of the studies is that it's uh, certain effects on areas of the brain that are hyperstimulated to the point that they may in fact involve the erasures of memory. And so Alper and Lossoff uh, speculate that what may be happening with ibogaine is that we're basically giving the addicts a chance to wipe, 
clean, a sort of behavioral dynamic, a behavioral slate in which they have certain patterns of behavior that they repeat over and over again, and they can't seem to find their way out of that pattern. So you stimulate these parts of the brain that are engaged in behavioral memories, and all of a sudden, things are no longer the same. You don't have the same behavioral patterns. So um, this will probably be one of the areas in which we will likely find uh, support for government research. In fact, the uh, US government did fund phase one studies back in the 1990s and had approved phase two studies and then they abruptly dropped uh, the funding for continued studies. So now there's a whole medical subculture that has emerged in the use of ibogaine. Uh, it continues underground in the US. It's key to the, uh, the harm reduction movement in the Netherlands and it's being employed in many areas of the Caribbean and Mexico and Canada and other parts of the world where it is not prohibited by law. Uh, so in one sense, this may end up being a poster child for psychedelic medicine treatment of addictions just because it hasn't uh, come into uh, legal restrictions. Um, ketamine, um, a substance that um, Marmley has been considered a dissociative. Its uh, original approved uses was in the context of surgery and uh, it is not normally considered to be a psychedelic or hallucinogen, although those of you who have employed subclinical doses are probably aware that it can have many of the same kinds of effects that we associate with peak psychedelic experience, uh, albeit normally in much shorter periods of time. Uh, one of the interesting potentials that comes out of ketamine is that uh, this substance is already an approved drug. It's already gone through the four phases of evaluation in terms of a clinical safety and use. And so now it's in a context in which we would call off-label uses. Uh, so, um, Evan G. Kupitsky on Sunday will talk about his own research, which I think would be another one of the areas in which uh, psychedelic medicine may find itself uh, having the potential to catapult itself to the forefront of addictions therapy once people realize the powerful potential uh, that this substance has. So, um, peyote is one of the shamanic approaches to uh, treatment of addiction. Uh, once again, it's one of these treatment approaches that has been discovered not by medicine as much as it has been discovered by uh, people who are engaged in the use of these substances. Uh, Joseph Calabrese writes an article, The Therapeutic Use of Peyote in the Native American Church, in which he looks at sort of the history and dynamics of the treatment of addictions with peyote. One of the things I should point out about peyote is that it is uh, generally considered to be the only effective treatment of alcoholism in Indian country. And even people who have been uh, sort of wed to the model of the Alcoholics Anonymous approach to treatment of addictions have come to generally agree that uh, Native Americans who are addicted to alcohol or other substances don't get clean by AA or NA alone. It takes the peyote way to really make it happen for them. Um, there's a, a lot of discussion in the literature among a variety of people, Halpern, Calabrese, Aberly, regarding just what is the therapeutic mechanism of the peyote way. One of the interesting aspects of the use of peyote is that in most cases it's a subclinical dose. And you're taking one button, where as many as 10 or 15 or 20 buttons might be considered a psychedelic dose. So it's not at all the case that we can say that a large amount of a pharmacological agent is what's responsible for inducing uh, the dramatic changes that we find. Indeed, people who have looked at the dynamics of the peyote way say, well, what's most important here is you have a community of people who say, you're not supposed to drink anymore, and we're not going to let you drink anymore. So you've got a social support system, which of course is one of the things that AA touts as being key to sobriety. Another important part of the peyote way is that it uses an overnight ritual. Uh, in some of the stricter contexts, you know, you go into the Hogan at six or seven in the evening, and you don't get out to pee or poop or anything to the next morning. So it's sort of a, a strenuous activity that keeps you up all night, uh, normally prohibited from drinking water, and you're singing and chanting all night long. Um, in this context, Calabrese says that peyote really ought to be seen as a kind of cultural psychiatry rather than a pharmacological agent. He talks about these meaning therapies and sees peyote as a desemanticizing agent. He sees the peyote ritual as really sort of pulling people out of one worldview and allowing them to get a glimpse of another one. Now, one of the things that Native Americans experienced was pretty much the total loss of their religion. In the latter part of the 19th century, the federal government of the United States 
made it a felony to practice Native American rituals. And so the few that survived had to go underground. And most Native American groups lost their spirituality altogether to have it replaced with Quakerism or Protestantism or whoever happened to be getting money from the federal government to uh, colonize Native Americans at the, that time. And so they really ended up in the 20th century as a, as a people, in a sense, without a soul, or at least without a spiritual tradition to support that soulful longing for these transformative experiences. So in this sense, peyote may really have its most powerful transformative effects really through the dramatic community rituals that are induced overnight with the drumming and the chanting and the singing. Now this isn't to rule out altogether pharmacological effects. Um, in his review of uh, the treatment of alcoholism with a variety of substances, Halpern also points to an afterglow effect from the peyote. One might suspect that Halpern is speaking from personal experience. Once again, a kind of pharmacological elevation, uh, what in the old days we used to call the shit in grin that you just had for a few days after you did some of these wonderful substances. So I think that there is a pharmacological effect here, uh, but I think in the context of the peyote way, it's probably more a cultural therapy uh, than the pharmacology as the primary agent. On the other hand, in the case of ayahuasca, um, the way in which it's been employed for the treatment of addictions by uh, Jacques Mabit in Peru, uh, clearly has a dominant pharmacological approach. And in that sense, I would point to the fact that what he does is basically put people through what might be considered in broad terms a kind of shamanic initiation. You start off with large doses of the substances that are used as purgatives. Uh, they're then you know, graduated to additions of other plants. People spend up to weeks at a time out in the jungle alone under the supervision of traditional healers and that his treatment program is typically considered to be a seven to eight month or longer program for basically changing who you are as an individual. And uh, in this sense, I think that while the shamanic elements are clearly key to what he does, it's also the case that the pharmacological agents, and, and a number of them, not just the, uh, the primary plant combinations of ayahuasca, are viewed as being key. So um, later today, we will have a, a presentation by uh, the Zeugel Velder that apparently is looking at either some of her own or somebody else's research about the use of ayahuasca in the treatment of addictions. So we're not starting off anew if we turn to psychedelic medicines for the treatment of addictions. We have a good set of ideas about best practices and treatment protocols. Uh, Torsten Passy, who's also speaking here, uh, provides an overview in the book about contemporary psychedelic therapy and some of the lessons that have been learned about the best uses. Uh, Neil Goldsmith, provides a kind of eclectic view that combines both what's known by Western psychotherapy with what has been discovered in other cultures in terms of the best uses of this. Uh, in shamanic guidelines for psychedelic medicine, I look at how shamanic cultures have typically employed these substances. And some of these ideas have made their way into the Western world and mushroom circles and things like this. Although I think that there are many clear shamanic guidelines that have yet to be fully endorsed. For instance, a long-term fasting beforehand, sexual abstinence would be another one. These are not practices that are typically considered to be important in the uh, modern uses of psychedelic therapies. And then uh, Sean House provides an article that looks at common processes in psychedelic-induced psychospiritual change. And I think what's perhaps most significant about his article is that he finds some uh, key kernels uh, of psychedelic therapy insights in many different therapeutic traditions that haven't relied upon these tools but have emphasized that effects that these tools produce are key to the therapeutic process. So in one sense, we might say that all psychotherapy might be done better with these substances. So how can we get to the next step of effective application? Um, in the conclusions to volume one, Tom and I take an interdisciplinary approach that talks about what might be needed political venues for doing this, uh, what might be some of the ways in which, for instance, initiative processes can change in our own country, how these substances are made available. We've seen this with a uh, variety of uh, what have been called marijuana initiatives in Arizona and California, but have often been far more inclusive and included the psychedelic drugs as well. Um, we also point to the importance of educational approaches. In general, people are totally ignorant about these substances and what they can do. And so we're hoping that psychedelic medicine uh, may literally provide a textbook for trying to educate the public, as well as legislatures, as well as doctors themselves about the significance of these substances. Um, we've also touched briefly on what might be called ecumenical approaches. And uh, I think sometime tomorrow afternoon, I'm supposed to do a forum on 
ecumenical approaches and intentional community development to look at some of the ways in which these substances are and can be employed uh, in therapeutic or quasi-therapeutic context. And uh, we also have uh, from Tom, who will speak next, uh, a very capitalist plan, a corporate model for trying to get these substances to market and make them more widely available. Thank you. Michael has taken us from about 10,000 BC to the current, and I want to spend about the next few minutes talking about the next decade and ways to, uh, ways to advance our work using a corporate model. To sound strange, but we have to realize LSD was discovered by Sandoz, um, which is now part of Novartis, which is right over there a couple miles, and that this fits very much within the history of not only LSD development, but regular drug development. Let me first mention that um, we're meeting on Good Friday. I went through this this morning, so I won't do it anymore. But, uh, but uh, what we're talking about is a way of improving human life, and Good Friday certainly looks toward that. So the question I'm looking at is, what do we do for the next 10 years? How do we get from 2008 to 2018? The two impediments that I see in developing psychedelics are widespread lack of public knowledge. Now, we've all run into this one, in one way or another. I teach a course called Psychedelic Research, and when my students tell their parents they're taking a course in psychedelic research, the parents say, what are you wasting your time for? Didn't that all disappear in the 60s? Uh, you'll, you'll go crazy or grow a beard or some other terrible event. Um, and so... The, yeah, right. Um, so, so anyway, this is, a, this is a, the standard lack of knowledge we're all generally aware of. And the other one is lack of funding. We have a lot of people here at this conference who are doing research funded by maps, by, by donors, by people who are just very helpful, and a lot just doing research on their own. And yet to take a drug into, the, into a actual clinical use, it has to go through a large number of very expensive steps. And as Michael pointed out, we're, we've done very well on discovering drugs, on, on safety, and we're right now sort of in the phase two area. So I, I, the, my suggestion to this is one suggestion that addresses both of these problems, lack of knowledge and lack of funding. Now this is sort of a schematic idea of how I think of the number of people who are interested in unitive consciousness versus the number of people who are interested in money. This morning, Stan Groff mentioned the problem of greed. And we have talking about addiction. The major addiction in our culture is not alcohol or tobacco, it's money. More people will commit more crimes for money than any other thing. In fact, if you look at all the crimes that are committed, money is the major uh, motivator in practically all of them. We have to start realizing this. Culturally, we think somebody who has money is a, is a good person, we look up to them. That person, in most cases, I know one or two exceptions, all they want is more. Now, when you have a lot of something, you want some more, and you're willing to do illegal things for it, and you're willing to dedicate your life to it, that's called an addiction. So we are very much a money-addicted society. But my idea is to pull a sort of judo move on this and use money adoration as a way of getting people interested in psychedelics. So actually, probably this little box over here ought to be so small you can't see it in comparison with this, but I didn't want to make it uh, entirely invisible. Um, this is a, a quotation from Upton Sinclair, who was a, a socialist uh, writer of the early 20th century. And by the way, if anybody's interested in parapsychology, he has an absolutely fascinating book called Mental Radio. That's what he calls um, parapsychology. And I really recommend looking at it. And I think, when I see this, I think, boy, this is a real insight into human nature. And we've run across this in our friends and colleagues. So it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Wake up FDA and DEA. But we can change this quotation on, over on the right side. It is easy to get a man to understand something when his salary or income 
depends on is understanding it. So this is a using the money motivation to get people interested in psychedelics. So first I want to talk about spreading information and then talk about uh, uh, forming a corporation and uh, addressing the medical issues. <clears throat> so I think one way, is to do, one of the ways to do this is to get, let, arrange, invent some way of letting people invest in psychedelics. Um, and this would include a company whose service is basically the psychotherapies that we've been talking about here. In other words, move from individual people working more or less randomly into some sort of organization that will do this. Now, by no means am I saying this is the only move to make. It clearly isn't. But this is one of the moves to make between now and, um, let's say, 2018. And the, the service of this country, a company, would be exactly what Groff describes in doing psychotherapy. First, you screen people to determine who will benefit and who won't. You prepare them. Then you guide them through the session or sessions. And then you do follow-up. So this would be the service of the country, company. Now, there's not much money to be made so far in the development of LSD or psychedelic drugs. As Michael mentioned, them, they much, uh, a pharmaceutical company would much rather make a drug where you take once a day or three times a day, not once every three years or once a decade or so. Also, some, some are off patent. But there are companies um, whose service is providing psychedelic psychotherapies. So I'm, I have invented two names for this company. One, uh, Community Psychedelic Centers International, or the other is Psychedelic Solutions. And in the next few minutes, I want to show you that it's possible to raise over a billion dollars to, uh, to fund this company. That may sound like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but if you look at the number of people who have done psychedelics as possible investors, that doesn't become such an odd uh, idea. Also, when you approach the FDA or other government agencies with a billion dollar company with people who have invested in that company, they pay attention. If you or I, most of us, go to the FDA and say, we want to run an LSD study, they want to know who are you, what's your background, do you have any fun, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you're from Psychedelic Solutions Company and you're publicly owned, then they pay attention. So this is the, the general structure corporate structure that I have in mind for Community Centers International. And basically, there would be a division that would um, work with psychotherapy, much of the things, just exactly the things that Michael was talking about, and a professional development division. Professional development would be creative problem solving, the arts, religious use, all the personal development that we're, that we're talking about. And I've even invented a, a trading symbol for it, LSDD. So these are some of the things that the therapy center might do. All those that are on the list, except for autism, is something we've treated in our books. And you, you things we're just talking about are exactly what these things are. So uh, the center or centers would be located either independently or say in ho associated with hospitals or um, with, with state uh, hospitals. And they could treat all these, these various things that um, are very not, are not very treatable. The professional professional development centers um, would look at the other aspect of the way of, of using psychedelics. Um, you notice I have psychedelic medicine down there as the book that sort of outlines this. In my other book, Psychedelic Horizons, um, I've located uh, and talked about some of these other personal development uses, such as creative problem solving and invention. So the, there's a lot on creative problem solving. I'll be talking about some of this in my talk on Sunday. And also ways of developing the human mind. For example, if we're going to have a complete map of the human mind, we have to look at what our minds can do in every mind-body state, not just our ordinary state. And yet almost all psychology is focused on, let's say, cognitive studies of how we think in our ordinary awake state, not recognizing that there are lots of other states with their own cognitive, emotional, biological and physical processes. So the full development of the human mind has to include the recognizing that we can use our mind in many different states. This morning I mentioned the idea of um, installing mind states in a, in a brain or in a computer uh, or similar, is similar to uh, installing a new program in a computer. 
<clears throat> now, here we come on the spread of information. In the financial community, when somebody is considering investing in a company, they do something called due diligence. Or if you're running a mutual fund or, or a, a, a bank or a pension fund, you have to do what's called due diligence. And this is basically finding out, is this a good worthwhile investment? And if you're coming up with a new product or a new process, what you have to say is, does this product work? Does this service or process work? Now this then requires that people who are interested, remember the big money group there on the diagram, to start doing due diligence. In other words, to find out what has been done in psychedelic research. And the things that we're talking about in this conference are exactly the kind of things they would find out about. Not because they're interested in unit of consciousness, but because they're interested in fat wallets. So this is a way of, of, of using that natural uh, greed instinct, I guess, to get people to look at psychedelics. So what they would want, have to do is look at the material facts. In other words, what research has been done and is being done on the use of psychedelics both in a therapeutic situation and in a personal development situation. Who would do due dil diligence? Brokers, venture capitalists, investors, banks, mutual funds. I'm going to leave the, those colored one off for a minute. Pension funds, insurance companies, private funds, security analysts, endowment funds. So they then would, would be actually uh, fiduciarily required. A fiduciary responsibility is a responsibility you have when you handle somebody else's money. To, to ask themselves, is, is this something that, I, that we should invest in? How good is the evidence behind it? Now, the financial community is very used to looking at new ideas. Um, a lot of people don't look at that in the financial community, but one of the major ways that new ideas are developed are through people who develop little companies, either angels who are the original investors or venture capitalists, and then eventually the stock becomes public. Okay, now, the ones at the bottom that are uh, sort of purplish colored, the people who'd be, other people who would be interested in this, of course, are people with the, the illnesses and conditions that Michael was talking about. So whether it's people facing death or with OCD or post-traumatic and so forth and so forth, also would gain interest, uh, awareness of these problems through the due diligence process. That is, their friends, their investment advisors would look into this and pass the word along. Also the financial press. I worked briefly as a, a writer of business and financial materials and this would be fun to write about. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine the headlines that would be great to write about. And, you know, financial writers, like any other writers, like to have something that's fun to write about. So um, this is a, a very powerful, very influential group. Um, if, you go, if you're staying in the hotel next door, uh, try going to Channel 4 and you'll find Bloomberg Television, which is a worldwide business channel. They would have lots of fun studying this. If any of you watch Kramer, Kramer would just go wild on this. There are a few Kramerites out there. But where's the billion dollars? Okay, we've talked about spreading the information, using the financial information system as the conduit to take this information out to the general public. But a billion dollars? I mean, you know, let's get real. Well, I think this is real. Um, there are two bits of data that I'm uh, using on this. One is the 2002 National Drug Survey, and they found that uh, 24 million, 24 and a half million approximately, people in the United States had ever used LSD. Another 10 million had used some other psychedelic, probably um, MDMA at that particular point. Now, the latest report, 2006, doesn't give a total, or at least I couldn't find it in my quick look, but they mentioned that approximately uh, that year, there were 1.1 million first-time hallucinogen users, up previously from other years. So we'll work with this um, 24.5 million number, knowing that the number is actually much larger than this. Let's take a low-ball estimate that 1% of the people who have ever used psychedelics would become investors. And I think that's a low-ball number. And this are only the LSD users. So we have about 250,000 people. If each put in $5,000, we get a billion and a quarter dollars. Now the reason I've chosen 5,000 is that those of you in the United States, if you have IRAs or 401s, 
You, know, you, can, you can put $5,000 five, uh, $5, in, less if you're under a certain age, more if you're over a certain age. Um, so I've just used that as the, as the basic number to go at. So right now, we're up to a billion and a quarter dollars. Again, with 1% investment. And of course, there's no reason somebody's going to be limited to $5,000. What, what if it is more than 1%? Suppose it's 2% or 3%. What about the users of the other non-LSD hallucinogens? We've got another 10 million pay people in the United States. Now, right now, I've only talked about America. What about Switzerland or Germany? or all of Europe, or Canada, or Mexico. There are people all over the world who have tried these substances and know about them. They are potential investors. So the number could very easily, I think, go to two and a half to five billion dollars. Visa, the, the credit card company, went public this week and they raised 19 million dollars. I mean, yeah, 19 million dollars. Excuse me, billion dollars, okay? And of course they got a lot of publicity for that. Imagine an LSD company it became public at you know two billion dollars, two billion dollars. People always say, "Well, if you believe this, put your money where your mouth is." Well, this is an attempt to put your money where your mouth is, and we haven't included the financial community. We've only included people who've done psychedelics, and in, within the financial community, there are some powerful, influential people who know about psychedelics. They're not they're sitting in Wall Street with the blinds closed, not looking out the window, windows at all. And these are a list of some of the people, brokers, venture capitalists, investors, banks, mutual funds. All the people who had to do due diligence are also the people who have lines onto investments. So where would these funds go? Well, I'm running the, the, the rising researcher sessions here, and I don't think there's anybody in the rising research session who would turn down, say, a quarter of a million dollars to do research, or even half that amount. I mean, they're not picky. And, and this is where a little, a little bit of money, relatively in, in the pharmaceutical field, a little bit of money, can go a long way. And we know that there are a lot of other studies that need to be done. So it could go to help individual researchers, um, graduate fellowships and academic positions, foundations. For example, the sponsors of this conference could do a lot more. They're already organized. They know what they want to do. They have potential uh, funding candidates in mind. Uh, so Gaia could get it, or MAPS, or uh, Emil, uh, the uh, Drug Policy Consortium, Hefter, Arrowwood, and so forth. Now, this would also have, have to go to the preparation of guides and all the corporate development would have to happen. We're not suddenly going to have money to, to treat people and have nobody trained who's going to be able to treat those. So the, the talks by um, Ross and Gus and the Rising Researcher Foundation are beginning uh, to look at that problem. They are professors at um, NYU Hospital, uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York, and they've just got through teaching the first course in psychedelics to psychiatric um, uh, doctor, uh, doctors in training. It was so uh, successful, and they had people coming in from other fields, they had to move to a larger room. So they'll be talking about that uh, tomorrow. So on the path of drug discovery that Michael mentioned, this is where I see us in general, and of course it varies from drug to dr drug. A lot, of, a lot of research in the pharmaceutical injury has to go in for looking for certain for drug, drug candidates. It's a very long, complicated field, and it does a, there's a lot of uh, chemistry that goes into this. Um, so first there are a lot of candidates, then you winnow, winnow down the candidates, often but not always with animal studies, and you find out um, you know, how potential uh, the dangers of the drug. Um, then you get into phase one study, and again with, with psychedelics, this has already been passed. We're largely in phase two, where we have little pilot studies, efficacy studies, testing whether they really work. Um, and part of this is trying different doses on different illnesses or different indications. All, already a lot of that work has been done. Some, as Michael mentioned, and through the anthropological literature, some through the informal investigations. So uh, the, in terms of developing a drug, a lot of progress has already been made if we look at the standard development of a drug model. And then finally, we have to get to phase three. And these are the large controlled 
multi-site studies. And this is where the big money comes in. Um, and yet, there are enough people out there uh, who are interested in this. Um, some, like us, who know about psychedelics. Some who know about the money, uh, who I think would be very willing to fund this. So I hope in a couple years, when we're meeting here, I can address you, you know, my fellow stockholders. Thank you. Should we move outside right now? Or do we? Any good questions? Yes, did. Yes, I think it is, um, because it requires people to look at the evidence, not go with what the sort of general uh, common wisdom is. Um, also, um, the, uh, the fact that a company is willing to put hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on the line on this cuts a lot of uh, ice. It makes a lot of sense with, with people who look that way. Also, um, the standard way of, of presenting a company, of course, is something called a prospectus, where you set out the plan for the company. Um, these, are, these don't require um, you know, publications in, in regular consumer magazines. Also, um, when, this is, when this is seen as a legitimate field, and the move that I'm talking about is to make this a legitimate field. Okay? When this is a legitimate field, then you don't get other advertisers um, saying, well, we're, gonna, we're not gonna you know, advertise our guns or toothpicks or whatever in your magazine anymore, because it makes it legitimate. Uh, another aspect of this is that the people who would be doing the due diligence are also largely the people who are extremely influential in a society, that is, the rich, powerful people. And when they see this as a way that they can, something they can get invested in and interested in, um, they are also the ones who own the magazines. In fact, I would expect that a lot of publicity would come from, um, from basically magazine-owning companies and individuals. Um, for one thing, it's a good story. Oh, yeah. Yes, the drugs would have to go through the ordinary drug approval FDA process. That's, that's exactly right. Um, and um, the, the, this, I see this as a way of, over, of overcoming the, that problem. Because when you, when you have people out there who, um, when a company is out there pre uh, you know, presenting a new drug, um, it has more credibility than you know, if you and I do it. So I think this is a way of overcoming that.
Yes, the big thing that is undeveloped on this um, is the uh, workable business model. But if we consider what's the value of having somebody not being an alcoholic anymore, or well, not having, right. Yeah, there's no reason the, the company has to be based in any particular country. I would expect Switzerland or one of the Nordic countries might be a natural one. On the other hand, um, I think uh, the United States would be very open to this, present it in this model. For instance, people are not afraid of something when it comes in the model they're familiar with addressing. And people are familiar with addressing new ideas that come through a corporate model. Now that may be an unfortunate observation about our society, but that's the way it is. You know, and if, this, if psychedelic solutions comes on with, you know, with this model and say, this is what we plan to do, these are the, this is the research we're going to do to get the drugs approved, and then you do the re pay the, for the research, you get the research done, the usual drug approval method. And it fits into something people are familiar with. They're not familiar with you know, somebody opening a psychedelic research center out in the jungle somewhere. Not that it wouldn't work, but this is not the way of, th you have to use the way people are, people think about things to get things done. And I think this uses that model. Would this business open up uh, more natural setting research things that people like I and uh, I should think it would. I would yeah. just add, Tom proposed a 10-year plan. You know, I mean, clearly it would be three to five years to market for mm -hmm. anything that went through the normal approval well, process. Yeah. Sure, I think one could say, well, look, here's this company doing it, you know, and I'd like to develop my own clinic that does this too. You know, and then the, the individual practitioner would have, would be embedded within a model that people would understand. No, I think it's a winnable argument. You say, because I love my... Oh, it'll take a time, it'll take a while. Well, let me, let me add one thing. What, what this plan does is to involve the power centers of society. But we have to get, now people are against the wall. And the wall are by no means angry. It's an unwinnable wall. 
Can we go? Can we go on to another person, please? We have we have the people with their hands up here. Would you please? Yes, go ahead. I'm just wondering if you're worried about at all about mixing these two forces, given that the insurgent story being unprecedented, the nature of the psychedelic plant use goes into antiquity is it's never been sort of a corporatized model. Are you concerned at all about what might happen to the nature of it if you mix those two forces? No. The CIA couldn't find anything no. useful to do with it, so we may be okay. <laughs> yeah. Can the CIA find any example in the Go last ahead, 100 please. years any culture was covered? Please, please. Would you have need to say something about the textbook? Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas for that? Because well, I would say treating psychedelic medicine, the book that we published, as a textbook. All oh, right, but I mean a textbook, just a university level introductory course, psychedelic or something like that would be very interesting. I mean, to spread knowledge to the university level. Um, I, t I teach a course called Foundations of Psychedelic Studies. Um, I don't use a standard textbook. I use a number of books. I start with Doors of Perception, and I use one of Groff's books and, and some other books. Um, I think a textbook might be handy, but um, I like to use original texts. Go ahead. I would just add to that, when people say $200 for psychedelic medicine book, that's a lot to say, get your library to buy it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nicholas, <laughs> you have a question? Um, the company here, would it have a vision as to how to proceed with the whole, uh, with the whole issue, and how would it compile that vision if it was, was going to do so? Board of directory, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what you were asking. Yes. yes. Um, actually, I've written a, a sort of a, a fantasy prospectus, um, which describes the company. Um, a lot of the material that's right in here, um, and this is then made available either on both online and in printed versions. And then I think there would be very, very a lot of good press coverage. At first, I think the press coverage would be sort of shocked and. Um, and against it, then I think as the press started themselves to do due diligence, there would be a change in the in the tone um, and to recognize. For example, the Washington Post, one of the most powerful papers in Washington, uh, had the cover story of their Sunday Review section uh, about a month ago about a post-traumatic stress disease treated with MDMA. And Maps got a beautiful sort of part of that write-up. So when this get when when this gets out into the news, then they're make, we're making progress. And I think that this, that forming a corporation is one of the ways of drawing the attention of the media community to the research. In a sense, it's almost bait. I mean, as I said, as, as a writer, you know, this is a, you'd have fun with headlines, you know, Wall Street high on LSD, you know, meaning the stock or LSD do. Well, there, there are, um, the drugs that, are, that would be considered, those that have already been discovered, would include uh, Evogaine. Methadone is not that much of a business in, in terms of drugs. 
Um, it's a good business, but it's not much of a business. Um, also, um, this would be, you could approach insurance companies and say, okay, uh, if you're going to put this, if you're going to try methadone for this person, you're going to be giving them methadone every day or every week for X number of years until that person dies. Wouldn't you rather pay a few thousand dollars more, have this person go through psychedelic psychotherapy, and then you don't have to make these payments for the rest of your, you know, for the rest of that person's policy? This would apply to national health systems probably even better. Yeah. Well, my, my response would be is that more and more health care is being offered through prepaid plans. And prepaid plans have the interest in cost containment. And so when it comes down to their decision about whether they pay somebody's pharmaceutical bill for life or pay it for three or six months, then they're going to be the people that drive these decisions, I think. The lady in the back. I think Tom's approach is that we go through, for instance, in the United States, the FDA process. We get approval for a phase one trial because we spent, you know, $100,000 to demonstrate potential efficacy and put together our protocols. So you li literally get the, the government's approval to do these kinds of studies. And once you've gone through that process, then presumably you have the legitimate use of those things in the public market. Well, but the chance of non-survival and harm. Gentleman in the back. Well, see, right now, most of these substances are not illegal in the sense that they can't be used for medical purposes. It's just that there's a process that one has to go through to get approval for those kinds of uses. And what this company would propose to do is to basically go through that process of, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the phase one, two, three, and four trials, where you then get legal approval for a medical prescription for them. And how much is that? I think they estimate to take a drug to market is one hundred million dollars, so sixty-six million euros. We need a company sits and having uh, invest six hundred million euro and enforcing for LSD go through and say that's a medicine. I want it. Here's the approval. So the doctor would have to prescribe it under appropriate. But it's just you have a change management plan. Uh, you come up with that idea. Uh, that's the money which is there, but what the people say is basically it's a war of, it's a clash of cultures. Because some people have interest to keep people addicted because they earn money because of the unhealthiness of people. Yeah? We don't have to mention the names again, Pfizer, Novak, etc. Second, some people want that procreate is illegal because it's good business. And I don't know how many people if they're legal or illegal or government people or underworld world people earn a lot of money and they keep their power. So they fear LSD much more than cocaine because it's the opposite. It dissolves the ego as we have learned this morning and, la and last conference. So that's the concern they have. The money is one problem, but the second is it's a war. And who is there who wants to fight the war? That people will be killed. It's very difficult. Gentlemen here. I think another problem is how many of those 24 million persons uh, used LSD or, or other drugs or medical uses? How many of them? 
we might speculate very few, if any. I think it's mostly recreational. But I think Tom's idea is that these kind of people have had their consciousness about the potential of these substances change and they're potential investors when they get older. Maybe. <coughs> I'm hoping to meet some people who are interested in this. I also have a fin financial advisor in Boston who's uh, sort of dancing around the issue. So if you, can you get the, the participants, the way that I've created, a, I've created what's called a wellness association. And so we use uh, um, freedom of contract. So right, we, we assemble freedom of contract. Same thing in the porn industry is using the same thing that uh, No, I don't. Well, his idea is, is, to, is to have basically you get um, trained and permitted to do substances for yourself. And you have a registration that, that you, know, you can handle this and you're doing it yourself. And then the next form of the license, so this is his idea of how to get trained therapists out there and get it all legal. And so you know, really this company should match with that. But he's been working on that for 10 years uh, with the government. This isn't going out there. This is using the, the standard procedures so that the, the, the legal problems. All that's fine. Yeah. I want to make right. Sure right. That experience well, well, the company would do this because it would be able to afford it. Like you, you probably can't put a million dollars into studying whatever it is. Right, right. <laughs> but, if, well, but if you've got 250,000 people who would put in $1,000 or $5,000, you could do it. Thank you. you know, we're going to have to wrap up now. Our time is over. But I understand we have a place for a forum out there if people want to continue this discussion. So thank you very much for being here.